Moving on to something entirely different, the respiratory system. Every cell in your body must liberate energy, and of course that requires oxygen. The purpose of the respiratory system is thus to bring oxygen into the body, dump it into the blood so that all cells have access to it. At the same time, carbon dioxide, the waste product of aerobic respiration, needs to be removed from the body. The overall process of respiration can be broken down into five parts. First, we have pulmonary ventilation, which is known as breathing to most people. This is gas exchange between the atmosphere and the alveoli of the lungs. Next, there's external or pulmonary respiration. This is gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. Oxygen moves from the alveoli into the blood and carbon dioxide moves out of the blood into the alveoli. These dissolved gases need to be transported. Oxygen is transported to tissues that require it and carbon dioxide released as waste product by these tissues is transported by the blood back to the lungs. Next, we have internal or tissue respiration. This is the movement of gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen between the tissues and the blood. Finally, we have cellular respiration. This consists of the metabolic reactions that occur in every single cell in your body. These reactions liberate energy from the food that you eat and use that energy to make ATP. This, of course, requires oxygen. The reactions that occur within the mitochondria require oxygen. The citric acid cycle rips carbon off of food molecules and sticks them to oxygen to make the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. Oxygen is also the terminal electron acceptor for the electron transport chain. Together with free protons and oxygen, these spent electrons are used to make water. The respiratory system performs a number of other essential functions, including the regulation of blood pH. If your blood becomes too acidic, a condition known as acidosis, that means that you have a lot of free protons wandering around in the blood that can do some damage, so you need to get rid of those protons. There's a buffering reaction within the blood that will take those protons, stick them to bicarbonate, to make carbonic acid, which is then broken down into water and carbon dioxide. And you need to get rid of that carbon dioxide. If there's too much carbon dioxide in the blood, this reaction will run in the opposite direction and acidify your blood. So to get rid of that carbon dioxide, of course, you have to breathe. And if you have acidosis, which can be a very serious condition, you may find that you start panting uncontrollably. Your sense of smell requires breathing, of course. We breathe in air predominantly through our nose, and that air passes over olfactory receptors. Those receptors are going to sense the presence of particular molecules. They actually identify these molecules by shape. Inspired air also needs to be filtered, and this is done through the nose. So as air passes through the nasal cavities, any debris and potential pathogens will stick to the sticky surfaces within the nose. There's also the production of vocal sounds, communication. When you force air over your vocal cords, you can cause them to vibrate, and then you can modify those sounds using your tongue and lips. The internal surface of the lungs, i.e. the surface area of the alveoli, is enormous. Now, you've likely heard this comparison before, but if you were to take the inner surface of your lungs and flatten it out, well, you'd die. Seriously, though, uh, you'd die. But seriously, though, it would be larger than a tennis court. This massive surface area makes adequate gas exchange possible, but it also results in a great deal of water loss and heat loss to the air that we expire. Broadly speaking, the respiratory system can be divided into two structural regions. We have the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. The upper respiratory system is everything above the glottis, while the lower respiratory system is everything below. The glottis is the opening to the trachea, or windpipe, that carries air 
to the lungs. The nasal cavity, the oral cavity, and the pharynx make up the upper respiratory system. The lower respiratory system consists of the trachea, the bronchioles, the branches of the bronchioles and their finer branches, the alveoli, and other tissues that make up the lungs. The diaphragm is a sheet of muscle that changes the volume of the thoracic cavity containing the lungs. It separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. We can also divide the respiratory system into two zones based on function. There's the conducting zone, which, as the name suggests, is simply going to conduct air. It conducts air from the atmosphere down into your lungs and warms, filters, and moistens the air. Within the lungs, gas exchange occurs between the alveoli and the capillaries. This is referred to as the respiratory zone. Starting at the top, let's examine the route that gases take through this system. And we'll start by looking at the nose very briefly. Part of the nose, the part that your glasses sit on, the bridge of the nose, is supported by the nasal bones. The rest of the nose is supported by cartilage. The larger cartilages that attach to the nasal bones are predominantly hyaline cartilage. And then there's some elastic cartilage that comes off of those tougher cartilages. The elastic cartilage surrounds the external nares, or nostrils, as most people call them. The cartilage makes the nose quite flexible, while at the same time, of course, allowing it to spring back to its original shape. The nose and the nasal cavities within the skull perform some important functions. They warm and moisten the air, for instance. Imagine you're outside in the winter. The air is probably quite cold and probably quite dry. The respiratory surface within the lungs needs to be moist in order to function. Pre-warming and pre-moistening the air that comes into contact with the respiratory system will greatly decrease water loss and also heat loss at the respiratory surface of the lungs. A small area of epithelium within the nasal cavities contains the receptors responsible for olfaction or smell. And the nasal cavity also modifies speech. And you're probably aware of this if you have a bad cold or if you physically plug your nose, the sound of your voice changes a fair bit. Here we're seeing a sagittal section of the head. It's slightly off the midline, so it's not right on the mid-sagittal plane, it's slightly to the right so that we can see the entire nasal septum. The vomer and the ethmoid contribute to the bony portion of the nasal septum. The anterior portion, however, is made up by the septal cartilage, which is comprised of hyaline cartilage, and you can wiggle this back and forth. However, it's not as flexible as the elastic cartilages that hang off of this and support the nostrils. Looking at a sagittal section again, but this time with the nasal septum removed, we can see just how large the nasal cavities are. They occupy quite a large portion of the skull. They contain folds known as conchae, and the conchae will increase the surface area over which air can be moistened and warmed. At the very top of the nasal cavity is the cribriform plate. The bone here at the top of the ethmoid possesses tiny foramina, little openings like little pinpricks that allow bundles of axons from the olfactory epithelium to connect to the olfactory bulb. We can also see the tonsils, which we talked about a bit in our last topic when we looked at the lymphatic system. The adenoids are located within the nasopharynx, and within the buccal cavity we have the palatine tonsils and also the lingual tonsils. Here's the same view for a dissected cadaver. Keep in mind that fixation or preservation of tissues changes the colors and textures of the tissue quite a bit. They end up looking quite a bit different from how they looked in life. But once again, note the conche and the size of the nasal cavities. There really is quite a large surface area here. This is a coronal or frontal section through the head that shows the conche within the nose. Now, I'm not expecting you to know the individual conche don't worry too much about that, but realize that these are very thin bony structures. These bony structures are covered by a layer of mucosal epithelium. And in addition to warming and moistening air, 
this mucosal layer is quite sticky. Particulates in the air, dust, spores, potential pathogens will stick to this ciliated epithelium. A layer of mucus sits atop the cilia, forming a conveyor belt of sorts. When the cilia beat, this moves the mucus and anything stuck to it back to the oropharynx to be swallowed. Trapped microbes will, for the most part, be destroyed by the stomach. Sinuses are air cavities that exist within the facial bones of the skull. You can see there's a very large set of sinuses within the frontal bones and also within the maxilla. These serve to further moisten and warm the air and they also resonate and thereby amplify and deepen your voice. They can of course become infected sometimes or they can become blocked, which is potentially rather painful. If you have an inflammation of the sinuses, this is known as sinusitis. The nasal vestibule is the outermost portion of the nasal cavity, immediately deep to the nostrils. Basically, it's the part you can shove your finger into, not that I'm suggesting you do so. This portion of the nasal cavity is rather similar to skin. The epithelium that lines it is moist, and it does produce some mucus, but it's continuous with the skin of your face. It contains some sebaceous glands, some sweat glands, and also hair follicles things that we associate with skin. Although you might find your nose hair rather unsightly, it does actually serve a relatively important function. It helps trap and filter out large dust particles that you might breathe in. As mentioned, at the top of the nasal cavity, there's a small patch of epithelium, less than five centimeters squared, that's quite special. It contains the olfactory receptor cells that are responsible for smell. Now we don't have a great sense of smell compared to other mammals. Other mammals have more receptors and the receptive area is much, much larger. The receptor cells are specialized sensory neurons. Interspersed between these cells are cells that produce mucus. The receptive cells have cilia, as they're called, but they're not actually cilia. They're extensions from the ends of the cells that are embedded into the mucus and these cilia contain special little receptors that will sense the shape of molecules you inhale. But they have to be kept moist in order to function, and that's the role of the mucus here. Axons from the sensory cells synapse with cells in the olfactory bulb that then carry signals through the olfactory tract to the brain. Here on the left, we have a closer view of the receptive area. You can clearly see the quote unquote cilia that contain olfactory receptors, and you can see that the cilia are embedded within mucus. The mucus in this region is manufactured mainly by olfactory glands, also known as Bowman's glands. On the right, you're seeing an actual histological section from another part of the nasal cavity. At the top, we have cilia, real cilia this time, attached to pseudostratified epithelium. You can also see large goblet cells. The goblet cells generate mucus and also a watery fluid that contains lysozymes, which are enzymes that can attack the peptidoglycan of bacteria, and they also produce defensin, which is a compound that can punch holes into the membranes of bacteria. This region is also heavily vascularized. There's a lot of blood flow to this area. Let's move down into the pharynx. The pharynx, the throat, can be divided into three parts. We have the nasopharynx at the top, the oropharynx in the middle, and the laryngeopharynx below that. The pharynx connects the nasal passages and the back of the mouth with the passages that lead down into both the digestive and respiratory system. There's skeletal muscle within this region because you do, of course, have control over some of the stuff that's happening here, like the initiation of swallowing and talking, for instance. The uppermost portion of the pharynx is known as the nasopharynx, and it connects the nasal cavities to the oropharynx this portion of the pharynx should only ever conduct air. But that's not always the case. It might be, for instance, that you vomit, and a bit of that vomit goes up into the nasopharynx. I have to say, in my opinion, that's one of the most horrible sensations there is. Note that within this region, we have the pharyngeal tonsils, 
more commonly known as the adenoids, and we also have the opening to the auditory tube, which is more commonly known as the eustachian tube. And this tube leads back to the middle ear and allows pressure in the middle ear to equalize with the pressure of the throat. If this tube becomes filled with fluid, mucus, etc., then you may not be able to equalize the pressure in the ear and that can be rather painful. Yawning or swallowing stretches the throat and it may stretch the auditory tube and help clear that blockage. Below the nasopharynx is the oropharynx. The oropharynx connects the buccal cavity or oral cavity to the rest of the pharynx. The palatine tonsils hang down at the back of the soft palate here. Also notice the lingual tonsils at the back of the tongue. Both air and food pass through this region. Air can enter or exit through the mouth and nasal cavities, of course, and food passes through after being formed into a bolus by the tongue. Inferior to the oropharynx is the laryngeopharynx. And this is a rather important area. There's lots of stuff happening here. This is where air and food are separated. Both the oro and laryngeopharynx are lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Squamous epithelium is able to withstand the shear stresses or friction generated by the movement of food through these areas. This epithelium continues into the esophagus. Note that the esophagus goes down the back and the windpipe or trachea is in the front. The epiglottis is a flap of tissue that's supported by cartilage and it acts like a trap door. It's open when you breathe, but it closes over the glottis, the opening to the trachea, when you swallow. Of course, this is why it's a bad idea to talk while you're eating. If you're trying to talk, you're holding the epiglottis open and there's the possibility that food or fluids may go down the wrong tube. The larynx forms the glottis. It supports the trachea and epiglottis, and it also contains the vocal cords. The larynx itself is supported by the hyoid bone and a number of muscles and ligaments. Muscles originating from the hyoid bone move the larynx and epiglottis. They move the tongue and they help bring about swallowing. The larynx is made up of several different cartilages, but we'll just focus on the two largest. The largest cartilage of the larynx is the thyroid cartilage, and it's the one that forms the Adam's apple. There's a ridge or prominence along the thyroid cartilage, and that's what pokes out in some people. Below this cartilage is the cricoid cartilage. It attaches to the tracheal cartilages that make up the trachea. In this diagram, you can see the cartilage of the epiglottis poking out from behind the hyoid. Now we're looking at a sagittal section of the larynx. You can see the hyoid bone at the top. Recall that the hyoid bone is not rigidly attached to other bones. It's kind of free floating. It's attached loosely and held in place by ligaments and muscles that connect to the skull. It also attaches to the cartilages of the larynx by ligaments. Let's take a closer look at the epiglottis. The epiglottis has hyaline cartilage at its center. The surface is epithelial tissue, and that contains some mechanoreceptors and, fascinatingly, even some umami taste receptors. The mechanoreceptors contribute to the gag and cough reflexes. If there's pressure based on the epiglottis when there shouldn't be pressure, that will initiate a coughing or gagging response. Note that this will only occur if the person is conscious. So this is something to be wary of. If someone is unconscious and there is a chance that they might vomit, for instance, they won't necessarily elicit that response and cough out the vomit. That's something to be quite careful of. You don't want to die like a rock star. The cartilages of the larynx and trachea ensure that these structures maintain an open airway. Remember, that's quite different from the esophagus. The esophagus is generally collapsed, and that's why it's sometimes referred to as a potential tube. It's not usually an open tube, it only opens as food travels down it. But the larynx and the trachea have to be able to conduct air at all times. They need to be rigidly held open. These are preserved cartilages of a human larynx. The epiglottal cartilage is at the top. We can also see the bone of the hyoid. 
When you swallow, you can feel your larynx move, and this movement is brought about mainly by muscles originating from the hyoid. Let's take a look at a transverse or cross section below the larynx. In this diagram, posterior is at the top and anterior is at the bottom. The esophagus is posterior to the trachea. Again, the trachea needs to remain open at all times because you need air at all times, but the esophagus does not. The esophagus is soft and squishy and usually collapsed. Food is squeezed along by a process known as peristalsis, and this is where we have rhythmic contractions of visceral, smooth muscle. The esophagus is lined by squamous cells. The trachea, as you can see, is supported by hyaline cartilage. Note that the hyaline cartilage rings are not complete circles. They're C-shaped in cross-section. A muscle known as the trachealis muscle stretches across the open end of this C-shaped ring. It's a band of muscle that runs down the length of the trachea. When it contracts, it constricts the trachea slightly. The lumen of the trachea is, of course, the space within the trachea. The lumen is lined by pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. Lots of goblet cells are present and they dump mucus onto the cilia to trap debris. Again, this is a conveyor belt. The cilia are going to waft material up out of the lower respiratory tract and up into the pharynx so that you can swallow it and get rid of it. Adventitia connects the trachea to the surrounding connective tissue. The epithelium of the trachea, as mentioned, is ciliated and pseudostratified. Recall from Biology 111 that pseudostratified epithelium appears to consist of more than one layer because the nuclei appear to be offset. It is a single layer though. The cells are spindly and oddly shaped, but each cell is attached directly to the underlying basement membrane. Underneath the basement membrane is the connective tissue of the lamina propria. Together, the epithelium and the lamina propria constitute the mucosa. Underneath this is the submucosa, a layer of connective tissue that contains numerous mucus glands that connect to the surface of the epithelium through ducts. Below the submucosa is the hyaline cartilage of the tracheal rings that support the trachea and keep it from collapsing. Alrighty, let's take a look at the lungs. There's a small space between each lung and the body wall. That makes sense because the lungs expand and contract. They move around quite a bit, much like the heart. The pericardial cavity around the heart allows the heart to beat and move, but the lungs need to move even more. The cavity surrounding each lung is termed a pleural cavity, and this cavity is lined by serous membrane that generates lubricating serous fluid, which allows the lungs to slide freely along the body wall as they expand and contract. The innermost portion of the membrane, the outer layer of the lung itself, is referred to as the visceral pleura. The portion of the serous membrane that forms the interior of the body wall is termed the parietal pleura. Note that this is a continuous membrane though. The terms parietal and visceral just refer to location. So are we talking about part of the lung or part of the body wall? Infections and disorders can sometimes interfere with the production of serous fluid by the pleura. And as you might imagine, this creates a rather unpleasant and painful situation. If the pleural cavity is not sufficiently lubricated, the lung may stick to the body wall, which makes it rather difficult to breathe. Here's a transverse section of the chest, just above the heart. You can see that the heart occupies its own cavity, the pericardial cavity, while the lungs each occupy their own pleural cavity. The mass of tissue between these three cavities is the mediastinum. The mediastinum contains the esophagus, numerous blood vessels, and portions of the trachea and primary bronchi. All of these structures and these three cavities exist within the larger thoracic cavity. The trachea divides into two branches. It divides into one branch that goes to the left lung and of course one branch that goes to the right. These are the primary or main bronchi. Incidentally, if we were talking about just one, it's referred to as a bronchus. That's the singular form. The right lung has three lobes to it. 
There's a superior lobe, a middle lobe, and an inferior lobe. On the left lung, however, there's only two lobes. It's smaller. Also, on the left lung, there's a prominent notch, the cardiac notch, that accommodates the heart. The heart sits along the midline of your body, but its placement is not entirely symmetrical. It hangs over to the left a bit, hence the need for a notch on the left lung. The primary bronchi divide into secondary bronchi, which then divide into tertiary bronchi. Smaller branches are referred to as bronchioles. And this entire structure looks a whole lot like a tree, with the trachea being the trunk, and then finer and finer branches coming off of that. And this is referred to as the respiratory tree. Tissue structure changes considerably as we travel from the mouth and nose down into the lower respiratory system. Starting with support structures, we have cartilage support structures that start in the larynx and continue into the trachea. The trachea, remember, is supported by C-shaped rings of cartilage. These rings continue into the bronchi, but in the bronchioles, these rings are replaced by seemingly random bits and pieces and chunks of cartilage. As we go further still, there simply isn't enough room for cartilage, and these support structures are replaced by elastic fibers. Now let's examine the epithelium. In the nasal cavities, we have pseudostratified, ciliated, columnar epithelium. Recall that this forms part of the so-called mucociliary escalator that traps and removes debris. In the oropharynx and in the laryngeopharynx, we have squamous epithelium that can withstand the frictional forces generated by swallowing. As air passes into the trachea, we again have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. This is replaced by columnar epithelium without the cilia in the bronchi and then cuboidal epithelium in the bronchioles and eventually squamous epithelium in the alveoli. The escalator or conveyor belt that moves stuff, stuff up into your throat so that you can swallow it doesn't go all the way down into the little nitty gritty bits of your lungs. Instead, within the depths of the lungs, there's macrophages that wander around and gobble up any stray cells and debris. Also, as we go further and further into the lung, we see an increase in smooth muscle associated with the respiratory tract. These fine little tubes in your lungs can be closed off by smooth muscle. You can't completely close off the bronchi, but the smaller tubes can be closed off. The terminal bronchioles are the finest tubes that aren't connected directly to alveoli. Terminal bronchioles lead to the smallest bronchioles, which are the respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles conduct air into grape-like clumps of alveoli known as alveolar sacs. Now the alveoli themselves are sacs, so admittedly the terminology used here is a bit confusing. What you're seeing at the bottom here is a slide of the lung under high magnification, and hopefully you had a chance to see slides like this in the lab. The interior of the lung is a lot of empty space. The millions of microscopic air-filled alveoli that make up the lungs make them noticeably lighter than other organs of the same size. We're getting close to the end of the journey here. The walls of the alveoli, as you can see, are very, very thin. They consist of a single layer of squamous cells. Capillaries are in direct contact with the alveoli, and they too consist of a single layer of squamous cells. Elastic fibers support the clusters of alveoli, and notice that there's bands of smooth muscle around the terminal and respiratory bronchioles that can constrict them and shut off air passage to the sacs. Here's a highly magnified section through the alveoli, and two types of cells are visible. We have type 1 pneumonocytes and type 2 pneumonocytes. Pneumono means referring to the lung, and site, as you hopefully know by this point, means cell. Type 1 cells are simple squamous epithelium, so they're very flattened cells. You can see that they're very, very thin. 
They're thin so that gas can be exchanged very rapidly between these cells and the cells of the capillary. This is the site of exchange for carbon dioxide and oxygen. Type 2 cells, however, are cuboidal. They're not involved in gas exchange. Instead, they secrete surfactant. Surfactants are compounds that reduce surface tension. Essentially, they're detergents of sorts. Surfactants interrupt hydrogen bonding between water molecules. Think back to last term in Biology 111. We talked about the fact that water, when it's spread out in a thin film, forms a tight elastic surface due to hydrogen bonding. This is surface tension. A surfactant is an amphipathic molecule. It's got one end that's hydrophobic and one end that's hydrophilic. If you mix it with water, many of the water molecules will interact with the surfactant instead of interacting with other water molecules. The reason this is important is because we're dealing with microscopic little sacs and there's a thin film of water inside these sacs. The surfactant reduces the tension generated by hydrogen bonding, making it possible for the sac, uh, sac sorry, to expand during inhalation. The alveoli are supported by elastic fibers that help to support them and keep them open, but these fibers also store elastic energy. When you breathe in, you expand your alveoli and you create tension within the elastic fibers. That tension is stored there, and then when it's time to breathe out, that tension will help you constrict the alveoli and force air out of them. Note that alveoli also have little holes that connect them to adjacent alveoli. This makes sure that the alveoli are at equal pressure. It also allows macrophages to wander all through the lung. They can wander from one alveoli to the next and gobble up anything that shouldn't be there. Macrophages, however, can only gobble up a few bacteria before they're done. They die. They take one for the team. If they gobble up three or four bacteria, that usually kills them. They simply don't have enough enzymes or can't make the enzymes fast enough to break down the bacteria. When macrophages are dying from this overeating, what they'll do if they're in the lungs is they will wander up higher up into the respiratory system until they get caught by the mucociliary system, that little conveyor belt that will carry them up into the throat so that you can swallow them, and also the bacteria that they might contain. We eat millions of these little selfless macrophages every single day. The membrane between the alveoli and the capillaries is known as the respiratory membrane. It's two cells thick. It consists of a thin squamous layer that makes up the lining of the alveoli and a thin squamous layer that makes up the lining of a capillary. Oxygen and carbon dioxide can move across this two-layered membrane very, very readily. This is a nice little diagram here that shows all of the different cell types that we've talked about. Notice that the capillaries are extremely thin-walled. They travel in between alveoli and they're just big enough for individual red blood cells to sneak their way through. And finally, as always, here's our terminology list. Please enjoy responsibly.